Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-founder and managing director, Elevation Partners, Roger McNamee, in discussion with Skift founder and CEO, Rafet Ali. For the 35 years I spent as an investor, I shared Silicon Valley's commitment to technology that empowers the people who use it. Beginning in 2004, however, I noticed a transformation in the culture of Silicon Valley. And over the course of a decade, customer-focused models were replaced by the relentless pursuit of global scale, monopoly, and massive wealth. As Professor Zuboff told you, Google was the first to see the economic opportunity from converting all human experience into data. Google wants to make the world more efficient. They want to eliminate user stress that results from too many choices. Now, Google knew that society would not permit a business model based on denying consumer choice and free will, so they covered their tracks. Beginning around to, uh, 2012, Facebook adopted a similar strategy, later followed by Amazon, Microsoft, and others. For Google and Facebook, the business is behavioral prediction. They build a high-resolution data avatar of every consumer, a voodoo doll, if you will. They gather a tiny amount of data from user posts and queries, but the vast majority of their data comes from surveillance. Well, thank you, Roger, for being here. The person you saw on screen is live here. Um, so, Roger, um, I've known you for about 20 years. The last time you and I were on stage, I interviewed you uh, back in New York when you had investment in Forbes. Um, you've become the most high-profile tech activist today. Would you, would you call yourself an activist? I, I do call myself an activist, and it's a very unexpected situation for me. And you, obviously, you were one of the original early investors in Silicon Valley. You loved tech, your whole life has been spent in tech, and music, the two things you love. I loved it so much, I became a consultant on the HBO TV show. So, I mean, this is really my world, and I, I'm a reluctant activist, but... And I so tell me how it happened. You obviously wrote uh, a I, lot about it in this book, which all of you, uh, f from the morning, all of you who were here, have, a co have access to copy. If you don't, there's, uh, if you go to the registration desk, they'll give you a copy of this as well. So, so here, here's the thing, guys. I was a true believer in technology. And the tech world I arrived here in 1982 was a world about empowering the customer. It was also a world of very limited tech resources, so there wasn't the ability to make a global product. There wasn't the ability to do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And when I first met Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> It was right after the end of the social network movie timeline, right? He had just turned 22, and I helped him solve a problem, which I describe in great depth mm -hmm. in, the, in the book. Uh, and you were a mentor to him. And I wound up becoming a mentor to Mark for three years, and I helped to bring Sheryl Sandberg into Facebook. So, I mean, I, I believed in Facebook so intensely, the notion of becoming a critic would not have occurred to me. But in 2016, I started to see things going on, initially in the Democratic primary in January of 2016, then civil rights issues related to people expressing the interest in Black Lives Matter in uh, March, then the British vote on Brexit mm -hmm. in June, which made me realize that the same business model algorithms and advertising tools that made Facebook so successful could be used by bad actors to harm innocent people. And that did not fit my view of what Facebook was about. So I started looking for other people to see if anybody was seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And nobody was seeing it uh, until I convinced Walt Mossberg at the Recode blog to give me a chance to write about it. So I was gonna write an op-ed, and I was working on that in September and early October when we got another huge uh, uh, civil rights issue at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and then we learned about the Russians interfering in the election. That was when I reached out to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, my friends, and said, guys, there is something really wrong here. We collectively need to get on top of this. You mm -hmm. need to get on top of this. And in the book, I give you the actual draft op-ed that I sent them. And 
their response was not terribly surprising, but it was very disappointing because they treat it like a public relations problem, not like a business problem. Mm -hmm. This was nine days before the election in 2016. After the election, I pushed really hard. I'm going, guys, you got the U.S. election, you got Brexit, we got the Russians interfering, we got all these civil rights problems. They're saying hey, we're a platform, not a media company. We're cool, right? It's like not our problem. And I'm going, I'm sorry, you're in a trust business. At the end of the day, all business brands are built on trust. You got to do what Johnson & Johnson did when a guy put poison in bottles of Tylenol in Chicago in 1982. You got to leap to the defense of the people who use your product. You got to do whatever's necessary. And what will happen is you will you'll suffer in the short run, but you'll build so much trust it'll be worth it. This is what Boeing should have done with the 737 MAX, right? Mm. Because there's only one way these things end, right. right? Once you lose people's trust, you are screwed and it never comes back. I mean, you know, you guys are in the travel business. I mean, Boeing, what they have done to that brand, it's not at all obvious that they can recover from it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, who's gonna fly a 737 MAX now? I mean, you'd be crazy. I mean, they, you know, so you're in this weird situation where I'm, these people, I've been a mentor. Mm -hmm. I spent three months pleading with them to do the right thing. And it was only then, when they literally didn't budge at all, that I realized I got to, a choice. Mm -hmm. I can either sit back, let somebody else deal with it, or I can accept the fact that I was involved in this thing. My fund made a lot of money off its investment in Facebook. And I knew something the rest of the world didn't know. And there was an opportunity for me to protect the 2018 midterms and the 2020 elections by speaking out. And so beginning in early 2017, that's what I did. So with all the negative sentiment against Facebook today, um, is it frustrating for you that their business from a financial perspective or has not been affected yet? <laughs> or like, what do you, how, what is it, uh, what, what is... Rafai, you and I both began our careers as analysts, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm really good at is analyzing tech companies. It doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, they have a monopoly, right? Every one of you is completely dependent on Facebook to reach your audience. I am completely dependent. I just wrote a book about Facebook and, and Instagram. If I want to reach the people on Facebook and Instagram, where am I going to go? Right? No, none of this surprises me. In fact, I look at it and go, it, it, is it a challenge? Of course, it's a huge problem, right? But that's what monopoly is all about. You are resistant to external stimuli. And the thing that bothers me more than anything is not that Facebook screwed up in 2016, it, or that Google screwed up in 2016 with YouTube. Mm -hmm. what and bothers they're still me, doing it, it looks like. Huh? Google with YouTube is still doing it. Yeah. What bothers me is that now, faced with all the evidence, they're pretending like it doesn't matter. Like they don't have any responsibility to fix the mess. And I'm going, hang on, guys. Where are you going to live? I mean, right now, just this week or last week, Facebook announces Libra, which is essentially a tool that, if it works, destabilizes the global currency system and undermines the sovereignty of the countries that they want to live in and travel to. Mm -hmm. That's if it works. If it doesn't work, it blows things up in some unexpected way. Mm -hmm. And last week, Google put out a thing about the Toronto waterfront where they're basically converting Toronto into the matrix. And it's like, hello, are you guys that Some listening? of the people may not know that. So the, the Sidewalk Labs, which is their division. Yeah. So here's the deal. There's a division of Google called Sidewalk Labs. They do smart cities. And as I referred to in the video at the beginning, Professor Shoshana Zuboff, the most brilliant person I have met in a long, long time, wrote a book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism where she studied Google for 10 years. And she makes the point that Google and Facebook believe that democracy is a really inefficient way to run an economy. <laughs> and that you're much better off converting all human experience into data, running it through algorithms, and optimizing. The only downside of that 
is that we lose the freedom of choice. It becomes up to them to make choices. And we see this with products, you know, which are benign, like Google Maps, where if you're one of those people who uses Google Maps to tell you about commute times in the morning and optimal routes, some mornings it says, hey, today you need to take a different route. And you trust Google. But back at Google headquarters, what are they doing? They're doing load balancing. Load balancing is a euphemism for playing God, right? The way that they keep the routes moving smoothly is to move some portion of the audience to suboptimal routes to keep it moving well for everybody else. And every once in a while, it's your day. And you can say to yourself, you know, I'm okay with that. And then you go to Waze and you look at Waze and you go, it does the same thing, except the way that Waze monetizes, it gets paid for footfall. People being directed past people who pay mm. Waze. So they find out that you like ribs. So at mealtime, your Waze route is more often than not going to take you past rib places, even if that adds five minutes to the route. <laughs> And you trust all of this. And my point is, you may say, you know, I'm not bothered by that. And my point here is, for most of you, you just learned that that was what was going on. I think we need to have real, honest conversations about what these guys are up to. Because Sidewalk Labs in Toronto, if you think about how we did the moon landing, we started with the Gemini, you test going into Earth orbit, then you test docking in Earth orbit, then you test spacewalks, and then you do the same thing with the Apollo program in lunar orbit, and then finally you go to the, Earth's, the moon's surface. The Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto is the equivalent of Apollo 10. It's going to the moon, it's going down but not landing. Mm. Eventually they'll land, but they are basically doing a full conversion of a democratic system into an algorithmic system on 14 acres in Toronto with the plan to expand to the whole city. And maybe the people of Toronto are gonna be happy with that, but I guarantee you, until two months ago, when people like me started pointing out what was going on, they didn't know. It's, this is all very recent. All the, all the stories of, and your testimony is all very recent. It's all just been well, in the last... Well, yeah, but, 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 but the project's been in the works for a few years, yeah. right? It's just that, you know, they offer all these beautiful, bright, shiny objects. And, you know, essentially they said to, wow, we'll give you all this great traffic pattern data. Essentially the same stuff Bill Gates did when he was in high school, okay? Mm -hmm. And the Civic guys didn't realize that that was a lousy trade. You don't want to turn over democracy for $24 worth of jewelry, right? That's called Manhattan, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bad trade. And that is, literally, this was the equivalent of, of buying the Manhattan. And, uh, and the thing is, maybe we'll all conclude that's the world we want to live in, mm -hmm. but we should have an honest conversation about it first. And for you, you guys, say in this you're in the travel business, you're in the travel business, this really matters to you, okay? Because the truth is we're going through this really dangerous time where these platforms are being used to bring extreme voices into politics globally mm -hmm. that are undermining globalization. They are undermining the peace and the free trade that have been so important to prosperity over the last 70 years. These guys are undermining the travel business. They're undermining all the things that, you know, and maybe the thing that comes after will be okay. But it's not because they got a plan, mm -hmm. right? Facebook, Google, and the people who've been empowered by them are more about disruption than they are about optimizing the thing that comes after. Or they're about optimizing their own situation. They're not so worried about everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think we can have an intelligent, thoughtful conversation about that. So um, are you seeing, and you've, you, you uh, are in Washington a lot these days, yeah. talking to politicians and... And, and now outside of the country too, right? Right. You know, just started with Canada, going to Europe in September. Okay. And so is, uh, Europe is obviously way ahead in terms of antitrust and, and looking at the large tech companies or even large companies in general and 
thinking about restrictions, etc. Do you think that, that we're at the other end of the antitrust uh, world where things are finally going to change and it's not just about lower price as the, as the measure for uh, monopoly? God, I hope so. Is anybody here worried about Google in your business? I think pretty much everybody in the travel uh, industry. Come on, the rest of you are not being honest. Because if you're not worried about it, you're not paying attention, okay? You should be very worried. They have one MO, which is to have you do the work, they take the profit. Look at what's happened in media. Look at what is beginning to happen in transportation with smart cars. Look at what is happening with smart devices in general. Look at what these guys are doing in financial services. I mean, they're going to run over Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan like they're not even there. Hmm. I mean, they're redefining the economy so that data is the most important asset and they have absolute control over it. We have to use what power we have left to stop that or you will be working for them on their terms. And there will not be alternatives. Now, the U.S., I cannot overstate how profound the change in attitude on this has been in the last six months. I mean, a year ago, the notion that we would be having fulsome conversations in the Federal Trade Commission, the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, and the Congress at the same time about the same things with the same motivation? And it's become an election issue, actually, last night and tonight. From your lips to God's ears, man. I mean, seriously, this is, I mean, I've been at this for two and a half years. I've been on the road seven days a week for five months since the book. Plus, you've been wearing this suit and tie nonstop for well, these two and a half years. because I'm trying to show respect to the audiences that I'm speaking to. And the thing I want you to understand is that there is time, there is the opportunity to fix this. The 2020 elections, we can make this an issue. But here's the thing you have to start to think about, okay? For all of us, this data is a drug, a highly addictive drug. The notion of being able to see into the thoughts of consumers is really compelling. It's so much easier than what marketing used to be. But the cost of it is incredibly high. I mean, it's so destructive to brand because mm -hmm. anybody can play. Brand literally doesn't matter. It's so destructive to democracy because it is inherently authoritarian. It is so destructive to global trade because these companies literally don't care. And when you think about this... Do you this, think if the management of, let's say, Facebook, let's just focus on Facebook for a second, um, changes, would things change or no. is it structurally impossible no, now? No, here's the thing. It's about the business model. So we want to use antitrust to compete competitive alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. But there are four issues we're dealing with. And competition, which is what antitrust does, is only one of them. The other three relate to democracy, which is more than just election integrity. It's also the, the undermining of, of things like the power of states, which is what you know, Facebook's cryptocurrency is mm -hmm. undermining and what Google's daily behavior is all about. It's about privacy where I define privacy not as somebody stealing your identity or stealing your credit card, but privacy is the ability to make choices without fear. Mm -hmm. You know, to have sanctuaries, places where there's nobody spying on you, where, where Alexa's not listening, right? And then you have public health, which is all this damage being done to our children, all this damage being done to our politics, that are because the business models are aided and abetted by hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy theories. Not because these guys want to promote that, but because that stuff, sadly, is to human beings more engaging than facts. Mm -hmm. And so the algorithms promote the most engaging stuff. And so I think you make zero progress on democracy, privacy, and public health unless you go after surveillance capitalism. And that requires a change in all of our thinking. Because I'm really fine with first party intended use. So if your client wants to tell you what they're doing, what, who they are, what they, God bless. If you're Uber, right? Getting somebody's location in order to deliver a car, that makes total sense. But you shouldn't be able to pass that through to Google through an API or sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be able to use it for some use case that was not the one the person signed up for. Mm -hmm. 
And that is going to make your life more complicated. But I think that beats living in a corporate totalitarian environment that feels like the matrix. And the thing is, you don't want to wait till you're in the matrix to fight the matrix, <laughs> right? Yeah. You want to stop it before it's fully in place. So uh, you're the last speaker for the day. Give us, end with some hope. Oh, he, <laughs> hang on. Let me give you the hope. The hope is huge. No, hang on just a sec. I've been doing this two and a half years. When I started, there was no hope. Today, there's tons of it. So here's the thing. This isn't about right and left. In a country as polarized as ours, everything is about right and left. Mm -hmm. This is about right and wrong. And everybody gets it that way. I mean, I am every bit as welcome on Fox as I am on MSNBC, and I'm super welcome on both of them. Fox Business and CNBC. Conservative talk radio, NPR. Republicans. That's actually true. So it's, 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 it's a one it's, unifying It's a complete thing. unifier. This is going to be an issue that is a 2020 issue for everybody for the same reason. I mean, Trump will make it about the thing on conservatives, but th that's not where the high leverage thing is. Mm -hmm. And I'm t I have spoken to tens of thousands of people on my roadshow. And it is stunning. It doesn't matter where I am. Everybody's getting it, okay? And the key thing is, we've got this election cycle. You're all going to meet politicians running for office. First question is, why in God's name is Google or Microsoft allowed to scan documents or emails for economically valuable data? They say they're a common carrier. Common carrier rules make that a felony. Why, is, why are banks and credit card processors and credit rating agencies allowed to sell your most intimate financial data? Why is your cellular carrier allowed to sell your location? Why is anybody allowed to sell private data without your permission? Why are you allowed to even gather data on little kids in elementary school on Chromebooks and Google Classroom? Mm -hmm. I mean, none of that, this is, Professor Zuboff says that this is an issue. The issue of data privacy is like child labor in 1900. The debate in 1900 was between five hours a day of child labor and eight hours until somebody walks in and goes, excuse me, the right number is zero. Mm -hmm. And that is the right number here also. You will all be wildly better off in that environment because you will no longer have to be worried about Google being over your shoulder because your brand value in that instance will be much higher than theirs because you're much closer to the customer. So let's close, close with this question. If you're a startup in uh, um, travel today that is going to harness data because what else, because this is at the heart of pretty much every company these days and tech the data has to be there. What advice as an investor, I know you're not investing, you're investing less these days, but what advice as an investor would you give to them from, a, from yeah. an ethical standpoint? Watch Apple, right? Watch DuckDuckGo. Watch Disconnect. These guys are making protecting the consumer and their privacy and their personal data a feature. And they're getting to charge premiums for that, okay? In your business, this really works. Apple's credit card, right, with no data leakage. If you guys are the travel people without data leakage, if you're the people who respect the privacy of your travelers, if you help them, give them advice on how to protect their privacy when they go overseas. Like, give them burner phones, right? I mean, what are all the good practices? Travel is one of the places where people are most at risk. Who, there's nobody who has great services for like, hey, I'm going to Europe. I need a burner phone with the following apps on it. Mm. I mean, there's so many opportunities in your space to be the good guys on this issue. It's nuts. Go for it, people. All right, let's go for it. That's where we're going to end it. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate you My doing pleasure. it. My pleasure. Thank you all.